Ten years ago, if you had asked me whether there'd be any hemlocks in the forest still, I probably would have said no. I was seeing a lot of hemlocks dying and noticing that so many of the large trees had died. And to go out in the fells now and see small trees like this, it really gives me some hope. And today I want to tell you a little bit why I have that hope. So my name is Colin Orians. I'm a professor of biology at Tufts University and I am uh, also the director of the environmental studies program. And I've worked in the New England forest for quite a few years, but and also do research in other parts of the, of the country and the, and the world. My main interest is how do plants deal with stressors out in the environment? It could be how they uh, resist insects, how they deal with climate change. I study natural systems like where we are here, or I also study agricultural systems like coffee and tea. So today we're, we're here at the Middlesex Fells, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about hemlocks. So hemlocks are this foundational tree species that are really common in New England. I'm standing right here next to a hemlock, and they're a foundational species because they really change the environment. You can tell when you're underneath or in a stand of hemlock trees that it is um, really dark. There's not much growing on the ground below it. Um, it completely changes the way water moves through the environment. It changes the, the animals and the microbes and the birds that are associated with these forests. So it's a really important tree um, in the northeastern United States. Um, there's been a huge attack on these trees by an invasive insect. and I. Um, want to share some of what I've learned about um, the fate of hemlock trees in the Northeast. If you go to um, the Appalachians, pretty much all the hemlock has been lost. It's been killed by a woolly adelgid. This is an invasive insect that came over from Asia. It attacks these trees and they have no mechanism of resistance and so they die in four to five years. And so how is it that a small tiny insect can kill a big tree like this? And is there any mechanism by which these trees will survive? 10 years ago, I came to the fells and the trees were dripping with adelgids. And I thought, I'm gonna come back in 10 years and I'm not gonna see any hemlocks. And yet here we are standing below a hemlock tree. And so the question that I've been asking myself is why? Why is it the hemlocks aren't completely lost. So take a walk with me. Okay. So this was a hemlock that actually did die. So you can see if you're in a hemlock grove, you're going to see examples of trees that were alive and now are dead. Okay. And if we, if we keep going up, you'll see another tree on my right. It's not doing great, um, but it's hanging in there. But if you look really closely to these leaves and you turn it over, that's the hemlock woolly adelgid. It's these white little, um, what I would call nests. So the insect produces a sort of covering over itself as it's feeding on the needles. And one of the things that you'll, you should know about it, there's two generations per year. So in the spring, um, the female lays eggs, they crawl out to the tips of the branches, the larvae settle, and then they, they grow and they produce the wool to cover themselves. And that allows the insect to be in sort of like a little safety nest, not a lot eats them. And, and they grow and they produce this wool, and about now they're pretty much fully, about to be fully mature. The female will then lay eggs. Um, by the way, they're all females right here. They'll crawl out, they'll settle on the, the tips. Ideally, they're gonna settle on the tips of the new growth and they'll kind of go into a dormancy period. They'll emerge again in the fall and then they'll go through the whole cycle and they overwinter as, these, as adults. And so there's two generations. So the, the plant never gets a break. This is the time of year when plants wanna produce new needles and if they've got the adelgids sucking them basically dry, uh, the, the plant cannot produce new growth because all the nitrogen that's coming into the plant is going to the insect. When these adelgids get a hold 
of the hemlock and are able to establish within four or five years, you'll have branches like this and very likely that the whole tree could die. So in addition to the hemlock woolly adelgid, there are a couple other insects slash arthropods that attack hemlock. Uh, one of them is the elongate hemlock scale. Um, and it, it's on the undersides of the plants, lives on the needles. And um, if you zoom in, you can see the little scale insects on the needles. Okay, that is also a non-native species. And then the second player, that besides the adelgid, is actually a native, and it's, it's a spider mite, the spruce spider mite. And you can see webbing on the plant. Here's a really good example of the spider mite webbing. So that is a native species that also attacks. And so here we have a plant that is uh, naive to two exotic insects, the scale and the adelgid. It's potentially attacked by a native um, predator, the spruce spider mite. Occasionally you'll see gypsy moths on them. Occasionally you'll see this hemlock looper. So you would say, well, how is it that the hemlocks could possibly survive in the context of this? What's interesting is if the scale is already on the needles or on this branch, the adelgids don't like to settle there and start making the wool. They'll go to a different part of the tree. So when the hemlock ends up with a pretty good population of scale, the adelgids don't do very well. You end up with lower densities of the adelgid, densities that are low enough to not be quite as devastating. So if you look at this plant, how do you know it's not as devastating? You've got new growth. Um, and so you can see the damage caused by uh, the yellowing of the needles that's caused by the scale. You see evidence of the, the mites, but you see new growth. This is an example where two exotic herbivores are not necessarily worse than one. The adelgid comes in, it can clobber these plants, it can cause mortality, but if the scale is there as well, it depresses the ability of the adelgid to sort of take over the plant and kill it. So the native hemlock to Asia is occasionally attacked, but they're generally quite resistant. So in the native range, the woolly adelgid isn't able of sort of taking over the native hosts. And so this is an example where you have an evolutionary history between an insect and a plant, and they're kind of in a stalemate, right? The, the adelgid can attack, attack it, but it can't overcome it. The plant is quite resistant, so it can still thrive. But you bring those relationships into a new environment with a naive host, like the eastern hemlock, all of a sudden there's no inherent evolutionary uh, history, so there's no resistance within the hemlock. One of the things uh, that we learned recently is that um, if you want to control the adelgid, you can actually use chemical pesticides. And, and so they use neonicotinoids, which are in the news, and they're thought to be um, quite problematic to pollinators and other things. So, but in some places where they're really trying to keep the hemlocks alive, they've put neonicotinoids on the plant, it gets taken up by the plant and kills the adelgid at the needles. But it turns out the native species that I was telling you about earlier, the, the mite actually finds neonicotinoids to be kind of like candy. They actually do better. So the use of chemical pesticides to try to control the adelgid is actually not a good solution in the context of trying to sort of think about ways of saving our hemlocks because you're going to create a different kind of problem and a native species can become a pest. Like uh, many of the understory species that you see in the landscape, hemlock trees are incredibly shade tolerant. So when you have a, hem a grove of hemlocks, the only species you tend to see in the understory are more hemlocks because they're really shade tolerant. But it's also true that they can do well under deciduous stands because these leaves are sort of the needles are out in the spring, they can start photosynthesizing early in the spring.
And, and because of that, they can produce really good new growth in April and May before the canopy closes up. You'll end up with really good growth. So this ends up being the prime time for hemlocks to grow, is in the spring before the canopy closes. Now if the adelgid is feeding on the plants and that new growth can't happen, there is no other time of year to produce new growth. And, and what we have been able to show is that the presence of delgid feeding on the branch stops new growth. It can completely stop it. And so if you're walking through the forest and you're looking for, are the plants healthy? This time of year, look for evidence of whether or not it's producing this light green new growth.